Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for today. Um, we thank you, Lord, for you are so good and you are so kind to us. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for gathering us together in this place, Lord, as discipleship year three. I pray, Father, Holy Spirit, that you continue to lead us and guide us in the conversations that we are to have, Lord, uh, regarding the revivalists that we are going to be speaking about. Holy Spirit, I pray that you continue to grant us the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may grow in the knowledge of you. I pray, Lord, that as we speak and as we share about revivalists, Lord, may we uh, really dive deep into their lives, Lord, and may their lives really impact the way that we live our lives, God. And so I just want to thank you once again for all that you're doing here in the midst of us, for supplying us with knowledge of your will, for supplying us in the knowledge of your word, Father. And we just continue to thank you, God, for allowing us to, to be privileged, Lord, to be able to, to meet and gather together in this place today. I thank you, Lord, for everyone who is here today and for everyone who cannot make it today, Lord, continue to bless them and, and guide them as well we thank you we glorify and we bless your holy name in jesus name we pray amen amen okay so i guess there's only four of us so that's okay when two or three are gathered in his name there he is in the midst of us so we acknowledge your presence in our midst holy spirit we thank you that we can gather in your name and there you are in our midst amen all right. So, um, so just you two. Whoever wants to go first. Okay, I can start. Um, so as we talked about George Whitefield and, you know, when um, he found salvation and found God, um, he continued on actually his his uh, education in Oxford. And in 1736, he graduated from Oxford. Um, so he, he was given a license to be able to, to preach and teach um, in that community. And so on June 27th, 1736, Whitefield would first preach publicly in his local church, Mary de Crypt, where he was first baptized. The title of his sermon was called the necessity and benefits of religious society. And so actually some people expected a polite and calm sermon, but Whitefield did not give one of this type. Um, it is written in, in the biography and the autobiography. Whitefield wrote that his preaching kindled a fire in the audience and that he was enabled to speak with some degree of gospel authority. Some discomfited audience members jeered at him for coming on so strong but most seemed odd or struck as Whitefield put it because um, Whitefield actually warned a lot about God's judgment he actually kept people accountable in how to live their lives and so uh, he had no patience uh, it is written also in the biography that he had no patience for the obligatory routine of church attendance instead he called people to discipline and accountability summoning them to enter the narrow passage of a sound conversion which was the one way now to heaven this was a life recorded a uh, reordered sorry around christ and the fellowship of true believers to some it was an exhilarating prospect others considered whitefield's message uh, puritanical and picky and, you know, it, it reminded me, especially of, of the times that we are in now about, you know, especially with, with earlier with the sign of the times post up sister Lolita posted, you know, about people um, saying these soft messages, when in reality, we need to really be hard pressed. And so George Whitefield, during this time, he sensed that sen he sensed um, that atmosphere uh, with his fellow believers that a lot of people were not held accountable, a lot of people were not held um, to the to the standard that God wants us to live. And so like, he would really um, talk about what it means to really live a life in, in the resurrection power of Christ and what it means to really uh, live a life ab abiding um, by God. And actually in August of 1736, uh, Whitefield would get a call from his friend Thomas uh, Bruton um, to preach for a couple months at the chapel um, of the Tower of London. And during his time there, um, his name and position as a preacher would actually begin to spread um, in London. He was also able to attract younger believers during this time as they were right as they were, uh, Wrightfield wrote, um, under serious impressions to hear some discourse under uh, discourse about the new birth. And this is also from the biography. Um, it's written while in London, Whitefield received a letter from John Wesley, who was in the Georgia colony with Charles to establish a Methodist mission. He wrote, does your heart burn within you? Wesley asked to, men to, to turn many others to righteousness. Behold, the whole land, thousands of thousands are before you who will bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord till they are met 
uh, till they are meet to be preachers of righteousness. Here are adults from the farthest parts of Europe and Asia and the inmost kingdoms of Africa. Add to these the known and unknown natives of this vast continent, and you will indeed have a great multitude which no man can number. This plea jarred Whitefield. He was just getting comfortable with his preaching duties in London and Oxford, but Wesley's letter made him think that perhaps there was an even higher level of commitment to Christ, the kind of commitment required of a missionary that he had yet not reached. And so like reading this part of his life, you know, um, especially with how in line it was with pastor's preaching regarding you know the great commission of going out to the nations and that and, and preaching to people you know um that's something that really struck george whitefield's heart because he had this revelation and realization that there are so much more people who have not heard the gospel and so this would actually ignite a fire in his heart um to to go to america and that's actually um, what my third part and my last part is going to be about his ministry in america and so this is what i'm going to be talking about right now um his the, the thing that I'm going to be talking about right now is his ministry here in Europe before he, he left um, to go to, to Georgia um, in America. And just a side note that I want to share with you guys, um, the Wesley brothers landed at Savannah, uh, Georgia, in, in February 1736. They joined hundreds of new settlers, including a number of Moravians. Um, these German pietist Christians had recently begun a missionary movement of unprecedented scope, establishing stations across the Atlantic world. Contacts between early Methodists and Moravians added an intentional quality to the evangelical movement. And sadly, um, actually during their time in Georgia, however, and the Wesley brothers would face a lot of personal conflict, which would collide with their ministry. Due to this, Charles Wesley would decide to move back to England in July of 1736, while John would face even more personal conflict. Um, it was written in, in his autobiography that Charles' irresolution, as well as John's troubles in Georgia, eroded Whitefield's veneration of them as spiritual fathers, just as Whitefield was beginning to realize what a powerful ministry he could have on his own. And actually, um, during this whole time period, two separate Moravian ministers would actually speak to the Wesley brothers in different locations and situations. One would speak to John in Georgia, and the other brother, a Moravian brother, would speak to Charles in England. Uh, and then and during these conversations, the Wesley brothers would actually be put in a place of re-evaluation re in their position with God. And because of these meetings and encounters with the Moravians, uh, the Wesley brothers would actually experience breakthroughs in the year of 1738. And so it's just funny, not funny, but it's just amazing to see how we've been learning about the Moravians and about how these Moravians were also able to, to, to lead a breakthrough um, with, within the Wesley brothers. And I firmly believe that it is because of, and during this time, 1737, they were still partaking um, in their prayers uh, I believe so. Um, and so like to, to see that the fruit of their prayers is, is also found in these Wesley brothers was something that that was really amazing to read. And so continuing on with George Whitefield's ministry, um, he would decide on going to Georgia, but the trip would actually be delayed later into the year of 1737. Um, during this waiting period, Whitefield's preaching would grow in abundance in his ministry in Bristol. Uh, people from a variety of denominations would come and others couldn't even enter due to the lack of seating. It was written, some offered him salaries if he would stay in Bristol instead of going to Georgia, but he actually um, rejected and denied the, uh, those, 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 um, uh, those offers. Um, and in May 1737, Whitefield would preach in Bristol five times a week. His sermons would go beyond normal capacity. As he wrote, people hung upon the rails of the organ loft, climbed upon the roof of the church, and made the church itself so hot with their breath that the steam would fall from the pillars like drops of rain. And he even had to push through the crowd to get to the pulpit and to see the amount and the effects that his ministry had. And mind you, this was only two or three months within his ministry in Europe, um, like to already have this much people um, be in your sermons, to have them outside of churches, to try to come upon churches. It also reminded me of, of William, uh, of, of the, of the, revivals in, in, in Azusa Street, you know, about how despite the lack of, of space, you know, people still wanted to make a way uh, to, to hear these preachings. And as Whitefield's fame grew, um, so did uh, the distress of other church officials. Unfortunately, they began to complain about Whitefield's views on conversion. Uh, but he would respond by saying that he wishes, quote unquote, um, this is from his words, reverent brethren, the ministers of the Church of England would more frequently entertain their people with 
with discourses of this nature than they commonly do, and that they would not, out of a, a servile fear of, disple- of displeasing some uh, particular persons, fail to declare the whole will of God, not suffer their people to rest satisfied with the shell uh, and shadow of religion. And this statement would actually anger some clergymen, leading to two of them banning him from speaking in their churches. And when I read this, it was also something that reminded me of what we've been learning um, in the signs of the times because George Whitefield essentially with this phrase, he challenged it, He challenged the leaders of the Church of England because during this time, he sensed that many of the people were speaking from a place of wanting to please the ears of others, of wanting to, 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 to com- compromise the whole will of God and the whole word of God so that people would, would, would find it easier to hear the word. And George Whitefield was not a fan of that. He was, he was not for that. And so he would actually speak out against these clergymen, against the leaders of the church of England um, to really speak the whole word of God, to really speak about uh, the judgments that are to come, to speak about what it means to really live a life um, that, 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 that forgets yourself and really chases after God. And so because of this, like what I said earlier, uh, sorry, uh, because of this, uh, you know, he would be banned from, from speaking in some churches because of, how uh, I guess quote unquote radical um, his his teachings were, uh, but th- that's something that I really uh, got to see when it comes to revivalists. You know, when we really see revival, um, people are not going to be speaking stuff about the easy stuff. You know, uh, these revivalists and and the things that they speak of really um, affect our, our our hearts. You know, really stir our hearts. I um, mean, it comes from a place of really wanting to see change in our lives. And I feel like, especially with George Whitefield, he really wanted to see genuine conversion um, in in people's hearts because um, he saw that a lot of people were lukewarm. He talked a lot about being lukewarm and about how this is uh, a, a danger in in Christian living. And so. Um, when when we come when it when it came to revivalists and just revivals as as a whole, we really need to see these type of preachings arise. You know, preachings about a uh, really holding other people accountable of of even the hard parts of the gospel about um about judgment you know about uh about refinement about being in the wilderness you know something that some things that even today people are uncomfortable to talk about um in order for revival to really happen we need to see the whole word of god uh, be preached just as george whitefield preached um during his ministry here in Europe and mostly in, in England. And, and so on January 6, 1738, Whitefield would actually start his journey in Georgia. And so um, in the span of one year, you know, George Whitefield would be able to speak to so many people in his community of Gloucester and reach out to so many other people in London and England to London and Bristol that his name would be would start to be widely known in the in the country of England. And so people were were very saddened when he made the decision to to go to Georgia. Uh, but they realized and and George Whitefield spoke to them saying that this was a, a calling that God really gave him. And so um, to really see that George Whitefield didn't really fall under the pressures of people, but really followed the will of God really goes to show how committed he was to God, that even though he started to get really known and really famous in, in England, even though a lot of people would be willing to pay for him to stay in England. And even though he w- he was really beloved in England, a lot of people really liked his preachings, you know, he was still willing to take that step of obedience and step of faith uh, toward God and still go to Georgia. And so on January 6, 1738, Whitefield would start his journey toward Georgia. And during his voyage, he would actually recruit a man named James Hambersham, who was a London merchant, who was also a convert from Whitefield's teachings to become a schoolmaster for the Georgia mission or like a teacher. And the ship that that Whitefield was on, it's, it was called the Whittaker, uh, would dock in a town named Deal in England for several weeks. And Whitefield would take that advantage uh, uh, to, to really speak to, to people. And he would actually start and kindle a revival over there as people would fill up churches to listen to him. And in one instance, like in Bristol, people would climb up the roof of the church just to hear Whitefield speak. And so um, after a couple weeks um, on February 2, 1738, Whitefield would, con- would continue on with his journey. And during these, uh, during these times of, 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 of sailing, he would often experience seasickness with the other passengers and temperatures would drop uh, below 50s, always constantly hitting the 40s. And something that's kind of funny uh, that rather than uh, comforting the others, he would actually take this opportunity to preach about the torments of hell, you know, uh, uh, talking about how if this, if you feel like this is bad, just imagine what hell would be. And so it, 
it's kind of humorous like that he took that opportunity of uncomfortability to talk about what it would really be like you know um to to suffer etern- eternally in hell and you know about and something that i really learned about george whitefield is that he would take the the smallest advantages to speak of the word of god and that's something that for me personally i i also want to learn to do that because i feel like the holy spirit uh, has given a lot of openings for george whitefield to speak in usually in like unconventional circumstances especially with uh the boat because the the, the boat that whitefield uh was sailing and didn't actually have have a place to 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 preach in and so because people started to really like his preachings during the sailing um they would actually create a room just for him to speak in and so to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and scenarios that George Whitefield took you know and and really took advantage of he was able to speak to 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 the to the people in the boat and a lot of those people were also converted and which 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 was really life changing for them. And so after 2 weeks, Whitefield would a lot would arrive in Gibraltar, Spain, um in 2 weeks where he would conduct sermons with according to Whitefield, uh, according to him uh, over a thousand people would attend these sermons in Spain. And you know to see that the impact of 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 his preaching and his word to reach Spain and to have that physical and language barrier but yet to have uh, over a thousand people attend your sermons uh, really goes to show how how one he was with the holy spirit how how much he really desired uh, to speak the word of god and so finally in may uh, after uh, m- many months after months of 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 sailing in may of 1738 after experiencing countless in- illnesses with sea sickness uh, george whitefield would eventually arrive in georgia where his preachings would impact the american colonies and so that was just uh just something that that he was able to to experience in his ministry in europe and so for my next part i'll be talking about uh, and it's probably going to be my longest part about his ministry in america and and the in its impact so yeah man man uh, i really liked the part where you talked about the way that he preached to people on the boat despite the temperatures cuz like i thought it seemed really funny but in a way i think um it was really good because um despite those like weather and circumstances it's like comparing it to like what it would really be like in hell for like eternity it becomes like something that people can actually apply and really see in their lives so i just thought it was really amazing to see the way that you know like he took every opportunity that he could despite things that seemed really grave and in an unlikely place because despite those circumstances people got saved. Yeah. Um yes, still it. I was just going to say I guess the Moravians are all over the place. <laughs> when you yeah, I was surprised when I actually read Moravians. about the Moravians there. I'm like, "Oh, the Moravians." Um so yeah, it was really cool to see that they were also like a catalyst um to the revi- to the, the to the revivals of the of the personal revivals of the Wesley brothers mm-hmm. you know because actually during this time i didn't really share about this during what i talked about because i wanted to focus more on george whitefield but the reason why george whitefield i mean uh, john wesley was having troubles was because of th- this relationship that we had that he had with someone i forgot her name but she was 17 years old and he really liked her and stuff and so to have this kind of and uh, and and because Uh, and he wanted to marry her actually but because he was taking too long to propose uh, he like left her and went for someone else and to see like that that emotional the way that it impacted him emotionally you know it grew and it affected his ministry and so um because of that you know he he grew to 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 ang- to be angry toward the person who married uh, his former lover and to see like that that's something that i guess i wouldn't want to call it like my new but like uh to have that something like that you know affect the ministry of John Whitefield uh and then to have this Moravian brother i uh, speak to him it really uh, put him to a place to realize like wow like my relationship with god is not as solid as i need it to be and so to have just that perspective of the Moravians being able to reach out to to these people was it was really interesting to read and and with um Charles uh Charles uh 
Wesley, um, his problem and struggles was that um, he didn't really trust God enough because every time he would lose funds, he would actually uh, continue to put trust in, in, in other people. Um, he would continue to put trust. He actually didn't register to, to become a, a missionary. He actually, I think, registered to become like a, like a servant of someone in order to, to gain funds for his ministry. Mm-hmm. And so that's just the different struggles and trials that the Wesley brothers faced until, you know, they met with the Moravians. Yeah. And, and and also, um, you know, when uh, your revivalists went to Spain, and despite of the uh, language barrier, yeah, it still continued on. So I mean, like I was thinking, okay, can I do this? You know. Yeah. So I was thinking, the you know the his the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in him. He really took hold of it. That hey, I can do all things. Whereas I was just saying, oh my goodness, like where where am I <laughs> compared to to Whitefield? So so yeah, I mean, if I guess if he did it, and also um, you know, ris- history really repeats itself because even Whitefield at that time already mentioned lukewarm, and and way back lukewarm, and now still the church is still in that uh, mode so yes anyhow I'm, I'm just amazed on how a person can be so and I guess you Angelo you can be too <laughs> or any anybody any one of us right if we just anyhow that's that's was just my are you gonna ask a question Tita Mario? No, I was going to um, comment. Y- you can ask. Uh, it was just to follow up on Tita Lolita's question yeah. in Spain. So was there like no translator at all during that sermon? Sorry, I was just wondering. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't stay in the biography I was reading. Um, but I don't know. I don't know how educated like the Spaniards were um, in English. But yeah, yeah. I'll look into it and I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay. More likely they didn't if there was a language barrier. Yeah. Because then they would have said like there was a translator, but still. But yeah, get back to her. To us on yeah, that. I'll get back to her. I think it's just by the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think... Um, yeah, that's true. Like it's by the spirit because, like what Sister Lilita was saying, like um, history repeats itself, and and um, with that history, like you can only see it in the in the scriptures, right? Like even those language, <clears throat> the verbiage, like using the words lukewarm and all that, like it's only found in the in the Bible, <clears throat> right? And so <clears throat> I think uh, they really. Um, studied and searched out the word um, that's why yeah but one of the things that actually like caught me when you were explaining because every time like he preaches you said that people were converted and so and I and that's the it's the word conversion that you that you kept saying that actually caught me because that's what we we need for people people's lives to happen that when we speak the word when we testify when we exhort that they get converted you know like paul he was converted that's actually i think that's where the first place where you find the word conversion happens um because you know you know the story of paul i don't need to say it but he was converted and so when you were saying that like then definitely there was an impact of his preaching to to those people if they were converted because it wasn't just like okay, let me hear it because it sounds so good, right? But like what you said, how his preachings were like not words that will tickle their ears or encourage them, but it's something that, you know, words that they really, truth that they really need to hear. And I think like, you know, like now in in this day, it's like there's a lot of people, I mean, with Sister Lilita's postings, like those are true stories, like, we do it they do exist that people that preachers that messengers don't want to teach on judgment they don't want to teach on correcting rebuking right because 
one, they don't want to offend their members. And then two, when they get offended, obviously they're going to leave, right? And so, you know, the fear of man, basically, instead of having the fear of God and just, you know, hey, we need to be trembling at his word and, and just having that reverence and this is what we need to preach. But yeah, I mean, I guess... It, like Sister Lirita was saying, it, history repeats itself. So, I mean, we do see that now too. So who are going to be the the remnant? Who are going to be the bold and courageous ones who will preach the truth like how George Whitefield did, how Catherine Coleman did, how, you know, Smith Wigglesworth did. And so we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. For us, you know, who are learning the our revival is that we need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in order for us to to do what they also did, you know, um, because it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can do all all those things. So, yeah, I agree. Like we we do want to be like like them, like what Sister Lilita said to you, Angela. Like you can be like him, and yeah, each one of us can be like like our revivalist, right? Like how we're studying their life. So, Amen. Oh, I, I, I want to also say, um, I was amused when in the boat and, and in the cold, like, okay, this is my chance to torment them more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm not going to comfort you. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, so uh, <laughs> I was just amused, like, uh, a lot of, of course, of the pastors, they want their members to be comfortable, but... Uh, that reminds me of Pastor Linda. I'm not going to comfort you. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, like, w- where can they go anyways? They can't go anywhere. So you just have to listen to my torments. <laughs> I was just amused by that. <laughs> but anyways, I mean, like, <laughs> whatever opportunities. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we just, we just are, we, we, we ignore those opportunities. <laughs> That's and uh, yeah, <laughs> anyhow, yeah, hey, amen. Mariel, you want to go next? Uh, yes, so this is my part two and Catherine Coleman. I'm going to be talking about her early ministry alongside with her sister and her brother in law. So um, just to recap, it was after the experience that she had in her church and she attended a revivalist meeting with her with her family. And what happened was in the revivalist meeting, um, the reverend was asking, okay, what they're going to do now with their lives. And she declared that she's now going to marry a preacher um, as her next step. And then she winked at the single reverend and this like really displeased her mother And her mother was really concerned about what she was going to do with her life, especially because she felt like she didn't have control over Catherine anymore and felt like she could fall under temptation at any moment. And so what happened was she was discussing with her sister Myrtle about um, Myrtle's idea to take Catherine with her to um, wherever she was going with the tent meetings and revivals with her husband, Everett Parrott. And so... Um, her conversation with her mother was that she had to leave like the next day and to take Catherine with her just for the summer and to return her during the fall for school. But um, the thing is, Catherine was only 16 years old at the time. And so her mother was really hesitant to let her daughter go. But the thing that really pushed her mom to allow Catherine to go was that um, was a desperation with Myrtle and asking for a sister to come because the, what she said was that she has to go because she said that she knew that this is what God wanted. And she was asking her mother, do you want to stand in God's way for, um, for allowing Catherine to come? And so um, her mother was just really shocked by this response and was saying, like, how do you know this is what God wants? And then her sister was just crying before her mom saying she, like, she just knew. And so after a lot of like pushing and pulling with um, deciding where Catherine was going to go, they eventually let um, Catherine accompany her sister and her brother um, to the tent revivals that they were going on to different communities. And um, at this time, 
they were going to go to Kansas City. And Catherine also suspected that there were other forces in her life that were conflicting because she knew that when she left, it would be one, her freedom from her community. And two, she would also knew that um, in the other direction, that this is where God was calling her to go. And she had tried to run away, but God still brought her back towards the call that she was to come for her ministry. And um, no matter even if she sinned, or like regardless of what she did each time god brought her back to that same place of repentance and she had been doing this um for the past two years um at the beginning catherine had a lot of conviction of god calling her out to the community and that it wasn't necessarily her sister that called her but even so um she felt guilty for accompanying her sister because of that time that she was in with her sister's marriage because um the sister her marriage with her husband wasn't really good yet she still lived with them and so to accommodate for the guilt that she felt she did a lot of laundering and ironing for them just the way that her mother would do and the reason that the marriage was so shaky was because Myrtle didn't truly love her husband and like most girls she saw it as an opportunity to live leave their hometown and so she just took it but in that time, um, Catherine actually grew, um, grew a lot. She enjoyed staying with her sister, who was stern, but um, with her for her maturity, but yet still was loving and kind to her as a sister. And um, in turn, Myrtle really needed Catherine with her during that time of ministry because of Catherine's joyful presence while she was feeling weary serving with her husband. Um, because during this ministry, they didn't like how... Everett Parrott was um, running his ministry um, because his ministry circulated around 10 preachings where they would go town to town. And his one message was to repent and be saved. Um, he used a variety of texts in the scriptures and was known to be a shouting preacher. Um, and Catherine, during this time, she saw all of his sermons. She listened to everything that he had said and soon understood why her sister didn't want to attend those um, tent revivals anymore. Even though her husband got angry at her saying that, you know, like he needed her there for like to collect the offering or to serve playing the piano. Um, what Catherine noticed was that um, an Everett Parrot, she saw that there was an independent spirit that was going on with how he refused to work with the other churches and pastors in the community. Um, and in this, she was able to talk with her sister about how a lot of the pastors kind of like feared what they were doing. Um, they didn't really appreciate the revivals that were happening in their areas with the people that they were bringing to Christ. Um, they felt like uh, some of the pastors, they tried to collaborate in the beginning with them, but with all the different um with all of the different denominations there was always something different like whether like with the nazarenes about if they preached holiness or like the methodists asking them about sanctification um the way that she explained it to um catherine was that everyone was building their quote-unquote own kingdom on how they wanted to run things and um do ministry and to respond to this everett just made his own ministry um, along that tent. And this is what kind of burdened them. And so Catherine was naive at the time to understand what her sister was um, trying to say to her because she believed that it would just be easier to, you know, um, join a revival center and then send the people that were saved to the churches. But something that really broke her heart was that the people, even though that they were saved, um, her sister had to tell her that when they were saved and even though they left after the revivals that had happened, many of the churches turned away those people that had turned to God, saying that they weren't accepted in their church. So even though that they had just gotten saved, there was no one to disciple them afterwards. And that's why they weren't able to do anything else with those churches. Um, like with Catherine, she had like this weight in her heart where she was just sad because so many people weren't being saved. There's a lot of souls that were dying. And th with this, she also was able to understand the reason for her father's attitude towards going to church when she was a kid, where her father was not even comfortable entering the church because of the way that people felt or would um, treat him. Because um, in this way, she just really saw how um, denominations was kind of like, splitting people um people apart or rejecting other people from entering churches and with this um 
with learning about this, she went home that night um, with them and she just thought about a society where people of all denominations would come together, you know, not fighting, but really in unity, praising God um, in harmony and just being together against um, the darkness of the world. And she really believed and knew that this was possible because she knew that this is really what God had wanted. And she described it as it being like in the book of Acts where people would gather in one accord. And she says that if that were to happen, if people were to set aside their differences and come together, um, despite the denominations, then we would have Pentecost on earth. So even though at a young age, she was still able to really visualize this and like have this um, vision in her heart. But she didn't know that she would be able to see these things in the way that God was going to use her in the future of her ministry as she got older. Because um, she was described as um, a handmaiden for God um, to um, pour out his Holy Spirit into the people and that um, she would be um, leading the people, an army of the Lord into a new freedom and power as the world approached um, the end of like the age, or the end times. And so um Within these 10 meetings, as she started um, early ministering around the age of 16, 17, she would be with her sister only to just sing, um, to play piano and do duets for these people. And only twice that summer that she stayed with them, Parrot allowed for her to really just share her testimony and how she got saved. And um, the way that she did it was like she was so big in the way that she did whether that was with her gestures the way she spoke and even though she ended um and as she ended her testimony she always did it with a poem and so the people really received that um like they received it like um they really received it and they loved the way that um she spoke and how she worded everything it was really dramatic because no matter what it was Catherine always made sure that it was really big she always wanted to make sure that it was the best and um with this, many people decided that they would give more offerings. And with these happening, um, it was described that um, Parrot concluded that if Catherine continued under restraint, their relationship would kind of be like David and Saul. Like, you know, where Saul slayed a thousand and then David ten thousands. And there was like jealousy between them. But despite that realization, he still let her collect the offerings at the end because people tended to give more after she shared her testimony. And then um, with that response of the things happening, um, he kind of joked with her like, hey, you know, if you ever decide to stay with us, maybe you can start preaching. So pa Catherine didn't know that was a joke, but she took it seriously. And that really excited her, you know, as a young girl. And so every night she would just really like study the word. That's all she would do. She would really just read the scripture. She never went to school. Like, believe it or not, she actually never went to school for um, any like Bible school or anything. She really believed that the Holy Spirit would be her teacher. And so everything she learned was really just out of the Bible. And at that young age, she was already... Um, preparing sermons, having outlines ready, you know, just always being ready to really just share and preach the gospel whenever she had the chance. But as summer came to an end and all the time alone, hours that she spent studying the word, that time didn't come. And the parents, you know, they started making plans for the next fall that they would have for the ministry. But Catherine wasn't included in any of it. And um, as the summer closed, she never got to preach um, once. And um, by then, her dad sent the money for her ticket to bring her back home. Um, with this, Catherine just, you know, like she cried. She cried because she didn't want to go back home. Um, and her sister said that she actually didn't have to. And so um, Parrot came in overhearing their conversation, saying that um, he had inquired whether or not the ticket was refundable. And with that, um, she resold the ticket for um, money back and she was able to stay. And after that, she saw that um, the suitcase that she had prepared all of her clothes. She was talking about how she had dreams of that suitcase um, several times um, in her life, just because that was a turning point for her, whether or not she would return back to her old life in Concordia or to continue growing on her path um, in ministering and even starting her own ministry. <laughs> And after, um, with her relief of being able to stay and that turning point in her life, um, those early years for her ministry with, um, with her sister became 
one of the hardest, like several of the hardest years that she's ever had, yet one of the best years of her um, of her young life in ministering, um, because they would travel from community to community, and they would just like they're really faithful and knocking door to door to gather people to join their tent, their tent services at night. And um, in these times, um, her sister would also let her know about any things that she would do that would disgrace the ministry, whether that would be like the way that she sat because her legs were long and it would draw too much attention just to be um, really, really respectful. And um, during the same time um, within those five years together, um, Everett Paris got a hold of Dr. Price's pianist, and Dr. Price is also a minister who started, I believe, the first church in Australia, and he was also ministering um, around from England, and then um, they took his pianist named Helen Gulliford, and she's really significant for Catherine's life as she stayed beside Catherine during, when Catherine began her own ministry, and um Helen was around 11 years older than her, but they became close friends. And she kind of took um, that role for Myrtle for Catherine because at one point, the marriage for her sister became became really, really bad and really strained. Um, And so she only had um, Helen by her side before her sister left. So Helen would become later significant for her later ministry because she kind of protected her from heartbreak that would happen. Yet, um, despite her despite her trying um, to come between Catherine and um, a mistake that she made during her ministry, um, Catherine still got wrapped up in a scandal that happened later on in life with another man. And um, that kind of destroyed her ministry in a way at that point in her life so going back to the time that she was with her sister um the marriage between Myrtle and Everett was really bad and so she accused him a lot of being with other women and that led um to Everett being so mad that he left the three girls um he left the three girls where they were ministering took the tent and took it all the way to South Dakota so um, Catherine, her sister Myrtle, and um, Helen were just left um, in the place that they were ministering without hardly any funds. They didn't have funds to rent an area. They didn't have funds to stay in anywhere to sleep. And their food for the past two weeks was literally just canned tuna and bread that they were um, living off of. And Myrtle was the one who um, Myrtle was the one who led these preachings and um, preached to people where there was hardly also any people. And so with this, um, Myrtle kind of just gave in saying that in order for her to like, you know, like really make it that she would have to reunite with her husband in South Dakota. But Helen and Catherine were really, they they were really unsure about this decision. And so um, what happened was um, Helen as a concert artist, she was like, you know, like a huge pianist. She didn't really feel comfortable um, just doing these like small gatherings of people with like small pianos. And then Catherine just, she couldn't see herself having a future anymore with the parents for her own ministry. And so the last service that happened um, when Myrtle was actually getting ready to leave, one of the pastors, a Nazarene pastor had come up to them um, asking if they could, you know, if they could stay, you know, that they wouldn't leave. But Myrtle said that they had to go due to a lack of funds. But then um, the pastor was asking if the two girls could at least stay, which they readily agreed to, you know. And um, Myrtle said that, you know, that it was all right. And to, and she even offered So the pastor suggesting like, hey, maybe you can let Catherine preach, you know, because she's been wanting to, you know, just see what she can do. And the pastor actually agreed to this and literally the next night after um they began preaching together um side by side helen and catherine together and this became the start of her own personal ministry and this was around the same this is around the time that she was 21 years old in boys idaho in 1928 and so um when they arrived in um in idaho the only hall available for them to use was actually an opera house that had actually deteriorated it was like fallen apparently and it was just completely empty and dirty and no one no one wanted it yet um even after cleansing they thought like even after cleaning it the place wouldn't stand but um 
they knew that despite the way of the place or how it looked like the fervor that they had for God and the Holy Spirit together would be, it would be enough despite um, the circumstances of the building that they were in. Um, and so they were built, like, they were apparently like calling themselves um, God's girls. And so um, this is, um, they knew that what they could do if it was only the gospel is really just preach it as it is, you know, not removing anything, in, not adding anything to it, just really preaching the gospel. And before they knew it, they started holding six weeks of nightly services in this rusty old opera auditorium where the seats, both the balconies and the entire building was packed with people. And often these meetings would last even past midnight um, because of the Holy Spirit and the encounters that would happen. And so as they began traveling further throughout Idaho, they went to Twin Falls as well. And a lot of people welcomed them warmly. And um, as she was preaching, um, it was really cold one day when they arrived and she she actually slipped and broke or no, not broke. She fractured um, one of her legs. And so um, despite that physical hindrance, it didn't stop her from preaching. It didn't talk, stop her from preaching the gospel. She still got up on her cast and got up on the stage and started preaching the gospel to the people. And a lot of people, um, including like a nurse who had witnessed World War II, was calling her like a courageous woman for doing what she did and seeing the determination that she had to share despite being with crutches on that platform. Um, despite a lot of like the highs that they had in their ministry, early ministry, there was also a lot of lows um, because there was also critics that would come against her. The um, critics in the 1930s would say that Catherine was selling a mixture of quote unquote sex and salvation. And this was because um, they're saying in the biography that it was kind of right because what happened was they were really good at preaching the gospel. You know, like there was a unique, there was a unique way of how they presented it, but they would also linger after the services. And it was kind of misunderstood in what they were doing because um, her and Helen were both really beautiful young women right? And so after the services that they held, they would linger to pray for people or to like, you know, pray them through whatever was going on with them. And a lot of them would be vulnerable young men who kind of blurred the lines between the love of a heavenly father and the sex of appeal of a young woman who um, was really different to distinguish, especially with Catherine. Because for Catherine, regardless of who you were, whether you were a man, a woman, rich or poor, whether she knew you or she didn't know you, she would treat you the same way regardless. She would um, have that same heart for you. And for that, she was also really misunderstood. And um, these were um, part of their early ministry that they had together. Um, sometimes they also didn't have they also didn't have a place to stay. Um, they traveled west where people would actually never evangelize at all. And they would even go as far as staying inside turkey houses and outbuildings for up to three nights. And this like in the extreme cold um, before they were able to even get legitimate housing at a place. And even as she stayed in those houses, um, Catherine, she would she would stay up all night and just read her Bible and find comfort in the word of God, um, staying in those places. And eventually, um, her and Helen settled down in Denver and established their ministry there, like planted for more than five years. And the way that she defended her ministry was by claiming that God could find, this is what she said, she said that God could find no man that was able and willing to pay the price of a servant of God. So he called her a woman. And this was around the beginning of her early ministry as a young adult. That's it? Yes. So who's the author of your book? It was someone who was really close to her. It was Jamie Buckingham. Yeah, because and I was reading, I didn't include this because it wasn't focused on her life. It was more focused on him. But the reason he got inspired to write a biography was because after Catherine died, he, um, you know, he was really close to her and there was a lot of things revolving around her death. But he also had consistent dreams about her, you know, and in one of these dreams, um, like they had this um 
there was like this romantic relationship that they had and it wasn't that he was in love with her he didn't quite understand why because you know he was married and he shared this dream with his wife and other people and he even prayed it over and at one point like it was revealed to him and he finally understood that the reason he was really able to write this biography for Catherine was because of um, his love for her so that he would really be able to like depict her story um, in a way that wasn't like hindered just by facts but by really knowing her life and by really um, by really knowing her and then I'll talk about it later when they actually like encounter her and as well as um, the ministries and what happened in her ministry and during the sermons that she had in part three. Yeah, I asked because you said that um, with the scandal or the, the yeah. issue, you said um, there's some truth to it or something like that. Mm, not the scandal. Oh, no. Not the scandal. Um, the scandal is um, a different thing, but it was the critics that talked. Of, um, it was critics. It oh, wasn't. Nice. It wasn't Jamie um, Buckingham. It was oh. the critics. Yeah. So yeah, there's there. a lot of people that criticized her ministry that um, tried to bring her down in a way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like just, the the part where you were talking about like uh, sex and salvation. But that's not oh. what they meant to do at all. Okay. That's just how they interpret it. The critics oh, okay. that were trying to like go against yeah. her, like, "Oh, you're a woman." Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I no. thought I heard you <laughs> said that there was some truth. I'm like, huh? Uh, okay. um, it was true in the sense that pe- they misunderstood it and what they were doing in their ministry um, because of the men that would come to try to court Catherine in a sense because she had a lot of admirers that would come to her after during her service but she just thought of it as like oh like I'm going to like be praying for you or helping you pray if that makes sense yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, because of <laughs> so after her preachings, um, these men would come to her because you know they they wanted to pray, but they liked her and they confused, um, they confused the love that God had for them with um with her being an attractive young woman, trying to pray for them. Yeah. So the the true side would be the intentions of the guys is not right, but her intentions are not the same as their intention. Yes, precisely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. What uh, what came out of, of your story is that her faithfulness, like, okay, despite of the price that cost her uh, not, a, a few times or a lot of times, uh, they don't even have a place to stay, but but they continued on, um, Catherine and Helen. Right, so um, I, I I guess yeah, he, she, they understood the price, the cost of of obey obedience, <laughs> obedience, and also um, for the revivalists, uh, you can see that they really study the word, like like her, like at sixteen years old. She was, if you want to preach, yeah, I want to preach. So she studied and, 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 but was not able to, I mean, at, at that early age, but, but she, she studied the, the word, the Bible. So that's what I see in all the revival is that they're really into the word, <laughs> really into the word and, and the faithfulness that, uh, that, okay, we know that what the price that it will cost and, and, they're ready to pay the price, like yeah. with her at an early age. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. None. yeah. And uh, like us, <laughs> so comfortable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it makes us wonder. <laughs> I can, I want to share something because. Uh, uh, especially like with what I've been reading with George Whitefield and hearing, you know, um, I forgot her name already. Uh, Catherine Coleman. Catherine Coleman. Yeah. Coleman. 
sorry. Yeah, Catherine <laughs> Coleman. Um, to see that despite all the oppositions and all the trials and tribulations that they face, you know, I mean, it really just goes to show how much they they understand the relationship with God and do love God. And I think that's something that I really want to grab a hold of, you know, as we learn about you know revivals and these revivalists, uh, because you know, especially like with. Catherine Coleman and like her studying the word every day and then finding out she's not able to preach like you know I feel like a lot of people would feel discouraged at that point but you know she kept on going and you know to see that at such a young age she was able to discover her relationship with God and understand her relationship with God that she was even able to kind of kind of tell her mom no like I really want to do this I really want to go to this place because you know God is calling me uh, it's really ha- to really God to really know God in that personal intimate way at such a young age I was really a blessing you know and that's something that I also want to grab a hold of because I know that especially in each and every one of our lives you know God calls us um, to to a place that he wants us to be you know and when we answer that call you know how how fervent are we in keeping that call in our hearts how 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 much do we really trust and love god that despite you know living um in these turkey houses and man, like despite you know all the criticism despite you know even like struggles within the family you know to be able to persist and to continue to 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 serve the Lord, um, it goes beyond just emotional feeling. You know, it goes beyond just the knowledge, our, our physical knowledge. It's it's basically the way that she was able to reveal was through an intimate knowing of, of the word and, and God, you know, and that's something that I feel like a lot of these revivals really under, revivalists really understood uh, because, you know, I feel like as they continue on with their ministry, we know that as they also grow in popularity, there's also a lot of growing opposition that is within them. Um, and so to to be able to continue to persist uh, really goes to show how much they're, they're founded in the word, how much they've uh, really consolidated themselves in their relationship with God. And so that's just something that a lot of us believers today really need to do to strengthen and consolidate our relationships. Uh, because especially now, as we continue further on in the end times with all these uh, persecutions and, and oppositions and, uh, and things that are to come, you know, it's so important that we continue to persist. That's why Pastor has been talking to us about, you know, pressing on and pressing through uh, to really be able to not be content with where we are but to just continue to have this passion and wanting and enjoy and and the feeling of joy you know and, and being able to to learn more about who god is you know like when mario talked about how Catherine Coleman was so excited about being able to preach, you know, that I feel like, wow, like I want to, I want to have that same feeling, you know, when Pastora is like, Pastora, when Pastora is like, oh, Angela, I want you to facilitate, like, I want to be excited to facilitate, you know, when Pastora says, Angela, I want you to exhort on this and that, or like, if other people ask me to speak, and you know, I want to be excited, because that is an outlet for me to be, to be able to speak from what I know, and from who I, and from like where where I come from in my in my relationship with God, and so that's just something that that like really touched my heart as Marla was speaking. Yeah. Amen. Um, you know, when you were talking about um, when Catherine Coleman, what she made an emotional decision, like the more that like I kind of just pause on it, it's like what she did was out I feel like for me it would be like out of the normal decision that someone would make because that also became such a deciding point in her life whether or not she would actually go towards her own ministry or still continue to stay with her sister because I feel like if you were in that situation your sibling was going through like a falling apart marriage like would you have the wisdom to immediately say like I'm going to wait on it and still decide what I'm going to say or like make the emotional decision to accompany them because like with her she didn't accompany her sister she like I feel like God really just gave her the, the wisdom to show her that like you know like this is going to be like a dead end for like your ministry and like in the end she still chose like she still chose God I guess like over over like over like her her family and the sister situation yeah so it's like also for me it's like would I be able to like have that love for God where I would still choose him above everything else. Amen. I just thought that was so cool because like, I think everything that we've been talking about is really cool because it's like, you know, these are like real people with real things that happen in their lives. And despite that, we can still somehow relate to them in our own ways. And so just the fact of being able to relate to them kind of like, I feel like for me, it implies like, you know, like we can also do like, be able to do the things that they were able to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
because I had yeah. before this I honestly thought that these things were like unreachable like it's like oh like Catherine Kuhlman's like Catherine Kuhlman you know like she's like really far away but really it's like even looking at her age of like 16 17 and like how she was it's like you know like she's really like it's not that different from us and she even talks about that as well saying that she's like she's nothing special like you know she's just a common person you know it's like just the idea that she was used by God yeah yeah uh, I was just reminded by um, last Sunday's preaching of Pastor when she mentioned you should hate your mother, you should hate your father, <laughs> hate your family. That was really a strong word <laughs> for me because uh, <clears throat> at the onset when I started going to the church of Pastor, like like I had to choose to my mom, my mother, or you know god uh if if you can say but then uh but then we know better right and uh, uh <clears throat> i like what samara even mentioned uh or or Mer- with 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 uh catherine uh not following her sister at that early age and uh just really listening to the voice of of god and uh despite of uh connect disconnecting ourselves with the family so yes <laughs> anyhow <laughs> I, I was just reminded by that what Sisamara mentioned and with Catherine <laughs> <clears throat> yeah I, I was gonna mention that too yeah like the preaching the hate your mother and your father yeah yep oh, yeah, you might close us Yes. All right. Um, Father God, I just thank you so much for tonight and allowing for us to gather. Um, Holy Spirit, I thank you so much that you are here with us, that you are guiding this meeting. And I thank you for um, the conversations that we were able to have, the things that we've learned, and the things as well as that um, as what we shared. Um, I thank you so much, Lord, for the encouragement that you've given us, that we are able to do the same things that um, these revivalists um, have paved the way before us to do, God. And I pray, Lord, that um, um, as we leave this meeting tonight, God, that you would continue to cover us and that um, you would continue to give us wisdom and revelation on our lives, um, helping us to, um, to choose you, God, even if it may seem hard, oh Lord. Um, in Jesus' name, I thank you, God, and we love you, oh Lord. Um, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.